church. Walking in sunlight on my journey and over the mountains through the deep hill. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, it's heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory. here and we extend a very special welcome to any of our guests, our visitors that we have with us today. Thank you especially for being here. I'm going to begin our worship period with a reading from Psalm 108, Psalm 108, beginning in verse 3. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great above the heavens and your truth reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth. Let's stand and sing. <clears throat>
Our dear Lord and our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with great joy and yet with a sense of sadness in our hearts as well. Father, we thank you for inviting us here. We thank you for being with us. And Father, we take great joy in the fact that we may gather in your name with those who also love you and speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, encouraging each other as we live for you. And Father, we thank you so much and take great joy in the fact that you love us so much that you sent Christ, your Son and our Savior, that we might have joy not only here, but joy everlasting. Father, we also are aware that Christ went to the cross because of our sin. And Father, we are sorrowful for that. And we ask your forgiveness for our sin. We ask your forgiveness for the necessity 
that you saw to provide your son as our savior. And Father, we ask your blessing that we may live as Christ would have us to live. Father, our sorrow is far overshadowed by the joy that we have because of you, because we know that in the fullness and the perfection of Christ's life and his sacrifice for us, that we look forward to eternal joy with you. Father, may we lift our voices this morning together and show that joy of the love that we have for you and the gratitude that we share. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. We are alone.
Uh, the reading before the communion this morning will be taken from Philippians. In the book of Philippians, we'll be reading chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, if you want to read along with me. Let his mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the same which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those in earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, you are our God, and we are your people, and we thank you so much for this memorial service that we can celebrate Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, that, dear Lord, he gave up his place on the throne in heaven with you to come to earth to teach us what you'd have us to, to know and to sacrifice his life for the remission of our sins. He was a perfect man, but he, but he knew that with this sinful earth that, that, we, that we have and in the, in the, in the evil that we had in our hearts, dear Lord, that he was willing to sacrifice his life for us. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for Christ Jesus. We thank you for this gift of life that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have through his through his service and through, our, through his teachings, that we have the, the hope of eternal life with you. Thank you so much for that gift. And dear Lord, as we take this bread that represents his body that was broken for us, help us remember that he did this and died for, for our sins, for the atonement of our sins. And it's in his holy and precious name we offer this prayer this morning. Amen. of our worship assembly. If you're unfamiliar with worship assemblies in churches of Christ, allow me to explain what we're doing. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and turned over to his enemies to be crucified, the Lord gathered with his apostles to observe the Jewish Passover. At that gathering, he inaugurated a new practice to be observed in the church after his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. This memorial involves eating and drinking items that symbolize his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then in the next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus informed the disciples that they would not observe this memorial again until the kingdom was established. And when the kingdom, also called the church, came into existence, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly. Acts 2, 42. How regularly? Acts 20 verse 7 reveals that on the first day of the week. It's our desire to follow the example of the New Testament church in all essential matters. That's why we do as they did and observe this memorial to Jesus every first day of the week.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heavens, we prepare to take this cup. We're so thankful for that great sacrifice of your son. We're so thankful that a sinner like I can have my sins washed away through the renewal and through Jesus' blood. We're so thankful for those gifts that we're able to abide in your presence after we've been cleansed. And we pray, dear Father, as we partake this cup this morning, it might reflect upon our lives and examine ourselves and how we can grow closer to you. I pray, dear Father, that each of us takes this cup this morning, that we might take it in a manner that's worthy unto you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, though that is the primary emphasis. The Lord's Supper also affords time for personal examination. Listen to Paul and his inspired teaching to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 through 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and examining our actions to see if our lives have been a proper reflection of our gratitude for what Jesus did for us. So this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. The mighty God of omniscient one is
Father, we are indeed so thankful to be here with all of our Christian friends that you've blessed us with to unite together in this morning of Bible study and worship and participation in the communion service. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we have to collect the monies that we have planned to give today. And we pray that you bless the efforts that are put forth from this congregation. Pray for many more souls to hear, hear the word, to learn it, and to obey it, and to be able to live with, with you eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul gave the following instructions to the church in the city of Corinth. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. For a congregation to carry out its necessary work, it must have operating funds. The passage we just read serves as our example for gathering Brown Trail's monetary resources. It's a simple free will offering. If you ever visit with us on a Sunday, we will collect an offering, but our guests are never obligated or pressured to give. The passing of collection trays is just an expedient way for us to fulfill God's desire that our members support the church's work. I love
Our scripture text this morning is taken from the book of Acts. Acts, the 17th chapter, will be, begin reading in verse 16. Now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we now, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. This morning we're going to continue with some thoughts that we began last Sunday morning with regard to our skeptical world and our engaging that world in conversation about things eternal and things spiritual. I mentioned last week just a few numbers, some statistics that seem to indicate that uh, what we probably already know just uh, from our own interaction with people, and that is that our world is getting increasingly uh, irreligious. Uh, in the past 10 years, studies have shown that people in our country who identify themselves as having no religious affiliation at all have grown from 16% to 23 percent. And as one might expect, uh, given the fact that uh, over time, especially since the 60s, God has been systematically removed from our public consciousness in many ways, one would expect that those that are younger, those that have been growing up more in that environment than those of us that are old, like Harold, uh, grew up in. And that's true. The numbers bear that out. Millennials uh, who claim no religious affiliation, uh, that number's at 34 percent, whereas the numbers across the board 23 percent. And so we're seeing more and more that our, our culture continues this shift away from God. So with that increasingly skeptical world, how do we engage that world? How do we live in it and try to influence that world for God? Well, we're looking at Acts chapter 17 to get some answers to that. And we looked at it uh, last week, with, uh, and, and I'll just very briefly go over the points that we made last week for those of you that might not have been here and for those rest of you who have slept since then. First thing we looked at was Paul's perceptions. In other words, when Paul came into Athens, what specifically did he see? And the first thing we noted was that Paul saw a city that was full of beauty and history. He gave just a few examples of what Athens might have looked like when the Apostle Paul came there. But it wasn't just a, a city of beauty and, and history, though it was that. Paul also noticed that it was a city full of idols. And that's the terminology that Luke uses in Acts 17, 16, when he describes what Paul saw. He saw a city given over to a city full of idols. 
And Athens was exactly that. I read that practically every public building in Athens was connected somehow, dedicated somehow to one of the ancient Greek gods. And there were idols all over the place. We referenced one of the, uh, the major thoroughfares, one of the major roads that, that went not only through the middle of the city of Athens itself, but it continued six miles outside the city down to the nearest port. And along that major thoroughfare were statues to idols, statues to Greek gods. And so as Paul went through Athens and, and meandered around, he, that's what he saw. A city full of idols. And then that led us from Paul's perceptions, from what Paul saw, to what we're calling Paul's poise, what he did. Luke is eventually going to record for us the things that Paul said in Athens. But before he talks about what Paul said, he tells us about what Paul did. And from that, we're drawing most of our information about engaging a skeptical world. We're basically looking at how Paul conducted himself, how he engaged people, to hopefully draw some lessons on how we might do the same. And here were the points under that that we made last week. We made three. Number one, don't lose your edge. Remember we talked about how the Bible tells us, Luke tells us in verse 16 of Acts 17 that as Paul did go through the city and he observed all of these idols and altars and all of these dedications to false gods that his spirit was stirred up within him. His spirit was provoked within him. You know, Paul lived in a world that, that had a lot of those kinds of things, a lot of idols and whatnot. But the fact that he lived among all of that did not soften his perspective on that. He didn't lose his edge, in other words. It still stirred him up to see that kind of false religion. And if we would engage our culture in, in, the, in a similar way, we've got to make sure that we don't get so accustomed to skepticism and so accustomed to an irreligious environment and so accustomed to, the, to all of these anti-God influences that we just become used to it and we lose our edge and we're unable to, to ourselves be provoked and be stirred up because of that. Don't lose your edge. Number two, understand your adversary. Understand your adversary. We noted that there were a couple of words used that described how Paul observed and examined. He'll even say to, to the, the people in Athens, as I was examining the articles of your, the objects of your devotion. And those words, observe and examine, that are used are, are words that indicate uh, close examination. And we likened it to how sometimes if we go to uh, some kind of a museum, for example, and, and we've got all of these different displays of different things, and we, we walk through and, and we stop and we engage the, the displays and we look and we read and we see and we, we examine, and that's essentially what these words seem to indicate Paul was doing as he was going through Athens. Maybe he was walking down that road that we know about that was lined with all of these different statues and he would walk up to one and see who it was dedicated to and notice that and think about that and contemplate that. And he goes to the next one and he sees it and the more he does that, the more his spirit is being stirred up within him because of all of this false religion and then all of a sudden he goes and sees another altar and he walks up to it to study it and he sees the dedication to an unknown God. And that's when Paul says, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, there's one they don't know for sure, and that's the one they need to know about. And so Paul was then able to take what he had learned by examining the objects of their worship, he was able to take that and then utilize it in his conversations with them. Understand your adversary. And then number three, last week we said, engage. Engage in conversation. Verse 17 says that Paul went into the synagogue and conversed there with the Jews and with the God-fearing Gentiles, and he also went to the marketplace, the Agora, the, the famous marketplace of, of Athens, which was not just a marketplace for goods and services, it was the marketplace of ideas. It's where they talked about things. 
It's where they engaged in conversation. And Paul went there. He engaged them on their turf. And so we, we tried to, to make an application about the marketplace of ideas today. And the one we specifically focused on had to do with, with um, uh, the Internet and social media and things like that. Now, I, I don't want to leave the impression, and perhaps I did, uh, based on some conversations that I had with others, that, that that was the only marketplace of ideas. And I don't intend to leave that impression. There, there are all kinds of different ways that we can engage people in conversation. It doesn't have to be through social media. I was just highlighting that as one of the major marketplaces uh, of uh, ideas today. And so those, those were the points that we made last time. I want to build on that because there's more that Paul does here. And one of the next things that we see, again, under the broad heading of Paul's poise, how he conducted himself in this skeptical environment, consider this point too. Find common ground and start where they are. We want to engage people in our world. Find some common ground and then start where they are. That's exactly what Paul did. You notice in verse 18 as he begins to engage them in conversation, he called attention to their religious inclination. One of the first things he said was, as I walked through your fair community, if I can paraphrase a little bit, he said, I, I came to realize and notice that you are very religious people. Well, that was something they had in common with the Apostle Paul. Now, obviously, the specifics of their religion and the specifics of their worship and devotion were miles apart. And he was going to get to that eventually, but he started by at least finding something that they held in common. They were religious. Paul was religious. That at least was something in common. And he started there and then would move later to other things. And when we think about us and, and our, our society, even in the realm of, uh, of, of skeptics and, and atheists, you know, we do still have some common ground with them. Now, obviously, on most things, many things, we're miles apart. But there are some things on which we have some agreement. And maybe by starting with some of those things, we can create a rapport and, and create an environment where, where people are more open to discuss our differences. For example... We all share with, whether skeptic or not, we would share a, a common acceptance of the, the philosophical law of rationality. That's what it's called in philosophy. And basically, it's, it's a philosophical law that states one should draw only those conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. Right? That, that's being rational. Now, we would both, skeptic and, and believer alike, would claim an allegiance to that principle, that we should draw only the conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. And so, maybe we start there. Maybe we try to, to, to emphasize to someone who might not think that we want to be rational. They might have a concept of someone who's a believer in God as being completely irrational and is, and is basing all of their decisions on things that are not even remotely connected to evidence. Well, maybe we could start by helping somebody to understand we're not against evidence at all. We believe very much in following the evidence wherever it leads, as they would claim to believe in that as well. Everyone would agree, skeptic and believer alike, that, for example, the Bible is here, right? It exists. It got here somehow. It owes its origin to someone. And so why, not, why don't we take that and go from there and see if we can determine the nature of its origin? We would all agree that human beings can do some very evil things. Skeptic and believer alike are in perfect agreement that there are evil people in this world who do a lot of terrible, evil things. No disagreement there. 
We would also agree, skeptic and believer alike, that the Bible presents God as both all-powerful and all-loving. Skeptic doesn't disagree that the Bible presents God as that way. Now, they don't believe that that, that God exists, but they believe that the Bible presents God as that. We can agree on that. And then that can lead us to discussing, well, how does all that work together with the existence of evil in the world that we also agree exists? We would agree, skeptic and believer alike, that truth has nothing to fear. That truth does not fear examination. That everyone is interested in arriving at the truth, at reality. So even though there are a lot of things that we're miles apart, there's some things that we have in agreement. Maybe we can start with some of, the, some of that common ground and start where they are. I find it interesting that in Paul's discussion with them, which we would get to later, verses 27 and 28, Paul actually quotes from two ancient Greek prophets, or poets rather, Two ancient Greek poets who were as pagan, <laughs> as pagan as the philosophers he was discussing things with. And Paul, talk about know your adversary. Paul, Paul knew these quotes from these Greek poets and brought them into his lesson, quoting from their sources, in other words. So this is hostile testimony. But what Paul quoted from them were quotations that in themselves were true. So Paul didn't quote anything that was false and, and claimed to believe something that actually wasn't true. Those, those Greek poets had actually stated some things, pagan though they were, they had actually made some statements that in themselves were true. And Paul took those statements and pulled them in and said, you know what, even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Was that true, that we're the offspring of God? Well, sure, yeah. Well, a Greek poet said that. He was pagan, but he said that, and what he said was true. And so Paul brought that into the... The conversation. So he was, he was finding some common ground and starting where they were in order to engage them in conversation about these very vital matters. Maybe we can learn a lesson from that. Start where they are. Find some common ground. Develop some kind of rapport that perhaps will open hearts and minds. Number next. Ignore insults. When you engage a skeptical society, ignore insults. In verse 18, these people that Paul is going to converse with, they, they want to take him to the Areopagus. This was a, a, a more, more of an official place than just the common marketplace where, where they talked about stuff. They, they would take some people to this Areopagus there at Mars Hill where, where official people, more prominent people might be able to address these philosophers. Some of the ancient Greek philosophers spoke at the Areopagus, Socrates and others. So they bring Paul there, but they say, verse 18, let's see what this babbler has to say. Your translation may have a different word there. But at its root, the word means seed gatherer. Seed gatherer. And it was used in, in more you know, mundane scenarios of, of like maybe a bird that, that, that hops around and just picks up seeds here and there. And from that, it grew into a, a, um, a, a derisive term. The people would use this term to refer to somebody who essentially, in harmony with the word's etymology, had, had essentially gone around and just gathered up a few scraps of knowledge. Idle, babbler, see, it was a slang term really for an ignoramus. Somebody who had picked up just a few little seeds of knowledge, but then spoke as if he knew a whole lot more than he actually does. In other words, this was not a flattering term. They essentially said, Let, let's listen to this ignoramus and see what he has to say. Well, Paul was far from an ignoramus. 
just from a purely secular perspective. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. Acts 22, verse 3. One of the most respected Jewish scholars, not just of his day, but of all time. And, as if that were not enough, Paul's also speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That kind of puts him up there, right? So he was about as far from an ignoramus as a person could be, and yet... You think Paul could have pinned their ears back verbally? I suspect he could have. Did he? There's not even an indication in the text that he even acknowledged what they said, much less tried to respond in kind. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt so that we may know how we ought to answer each one. Colossians 4, verse 6. Servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but gentle to all. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. They insulted Paul. He ignored it. We may find ourselves in situations where a skeptical world will hurl all kinds of insults at us just because we're Christians. Ignore the insults. And in addition to that, and more importantly than that, certainly don't instigate the insults. Let your speech be always with grace. And then number next, six, I think, if you're keeping score at home. Transition to points of difference. Transition to to points of difference. Remember, we talked about starting where they are. Start with some common ground. If you can find some, start with that. Start where they are. But eventually, you're going to have to trans transition into points of difference. Paul did not just continually and repeatedly emphasize their common ground. He did eventually move to their fundamental differences of belief. And our conversations need to go that way too, eventually. So in verses 23 and 24, we see where Paul does make that transition. And he puts it out there very plainly. He essentially said, look, there's, there's one God. And he's not like all of these images that you've crafted with your own hands. He transitioned to their points of differences. And that leads us then into Paul's preaching. We looked at Paul's perceptions... Right? Here's what he saw. Paul's poise. Here's how he acted. Now let's get into Paul's preaching. Here's what he said. His main points were these. God is creator. This is on verse 24. God is creator. He is Lord. And he is not confined to man-made temples. Verse 25, he is self-existent. He is responsible for everything that we see and everything that we are. Verse 26, 27. Also, verse 27, He created every person and nation that dwells on the earth, determines their rising and their falling. He is near, not far from any one of us. He's created us to seek Him. He's created us to find Him. He is our Father. And he is not like handcrafted idols. All of that in 27, 28, and 29. And then he concludes by saying God is also our judge. Verses 30 and 31. He's appointed a day. He's fixed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness through the one that he has ordained for that purpose. And he's given us the assurance that he's going to do that in raising him from the dead. So he spoke of God as judge and Jesus as resurrected Savior. Now those are the main... That's, he laid all of that out there. Those were their points of difference. But one thing I find interesting in Luke's account of this is that Luke doesn't record Paul expanding, really, on any of those points. Now, recognize he may have. Luke may not have recorded for us everything that Paul said on that occasion. And so he may have expanded on these in the, in the context of their conversation, and Luke is, may just very well be summarizing all of that. But there's nothing in the text, anyway, that indicates very much expansion on those points. Paul just basically presented them and said, look, here's the reality. Here is who God is. Here is His nature, and He's not like these images that you people have crafted of your own hand. 
Maybe in doing that, and in not necessarily expanding very much on that information, perhaps Paul was trying to sift his listeners into the interested and the non-interested. The interested and the obstinate. You know, Jesus did that a lot with his parables, didn't he? Didn't Jesus, with, with parables, isn't that what he did? Sifting his listeners, those that were interested in what he had to say, who may not have grasped the parables right off the bat, would come back to him later and say, would you explain to us the parable of the sower, for example? We'd like to know more about that. And those that just didn't have any interest in pursuing spiritual things further, they'd just reject it. Jesus did that. Seems like Paul's doing the same thing here. And lo and behold, it worked. If you look at the end of the chapter, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. In other words, there were some who said, we don't have any use for that. But there were others who said, you know what, I'm, I'd be interested in learning more about that. And guess what? Some did. Verse 34 Paul goes out of their midst, right? Verse 33, and the, but at some point later, some men joined him and ultimately believed. Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So those that were interested stayed with Paul, learned more, and some of them ultimately obeyed the gospel. Maybe that's a good thing for us to do as we engage people that are skeptical. You may not necessarily have to take somebody from A to Z in biblical theology, Present what you know is true. Here's, here's who God is. Here's how the Bible presents God. Here's, here's, what, here's what is the case about His nature and about who He is. And if they're interested, maybe they'll say, you know what, I, I'd like to lo know more about that. I'm interested in that. Could you teach me more? Could you tell me more about what you believe? Others may, when they hear that, just completely say, you're, you're nuts. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Okay, that's their choice. It's a tragic choice, but it's their choice. Someone described this, and I wish I knew who it was so I could give them credit for it. But I recently heard someone describe this as um, trying to put a rock in somebody's shoe. Ever been walking and you get just a little small rock, a little pebble that somehow gets down in your shoe? It's kind of irritating, isn't it? You're not going to walk very far with a little pebble in your shoe until you do what? Until you stop and deal with it. Maybe in our interactions with people, maybe that should be our initial goal. Let's put a rock in somebody's shoe. Give them something to think about. Give them something that they can take with them that the more they think about it, the more intriguing it becomes. The more concerned they become with it until they need to do something about that rock in their shoe. That looks to be a lot of what Paul was doing here. He gave them the broad scope. He said, look, here's, here's reality. This is who God is. He's not like these idols that you've created for yourself. And then some people got a rock in their shoe. And they said, you know what? I, I, need, to, I need to know more about this. Others said, I don't care. Paul focused on the ones that did and taught them, and they obeyed the gospel. Our world is becoming more and more irreligious to the point that we're, we're finding fewer and fewer people that we encounter who come to us with the question, what would God have me to do? It's becoming more and more that the people we encounter are more like Pharaoh in Exodus 5 verse 2 who said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? When you get someone who comes to you and says, what must I do to be saved? Or what would the Lord have me to do? Be thankful for that because it makes it a whole lot easier. But the more we encounter people that say, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? We've got a little more work ahead of us. But that's why we need to know our adversary, know where they're coming from, engage them in conversation, try to find some common ground if possible, ignore any insults, transition to those points of difference, and then affirm. 
with confidence that God is our creator. He is self-existent. He's the sustainer of life. He is sovereign over this world. He is our father and he will ultimately be our judge. That's how Paul presented God and he came across some honest, open hearts in Athens of all places in a place where there were idols on every street corner, when every public building was dedicated to some false god, Paul found honest, open hearts in that pagan environment. There's still honest hearts out there today, too. I'm convinced of that. Let it be our prayer that God will lead us in His providence to them, just as He led Paul to them in Athens a long time ago. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, with regard to Christians, he said, you, you shine as lights in the world. Let's do that. Let's not lose our edge. Let's allow our hearts to be stirred up to the task before us and do what we can. Put a rock in somebody's shoe that may lead them to seek more information, to seek God. And let's pray that God can use us according to His will and to His glory in whatever way He chooses to help people come to know Him as did Dionysius, Damaris, and those others in Acts 17, 34. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture in Acts 17 that offers us so much information about how to engage a skeptical world. And we pray that these lessons we'll take with us, we'll try to utilize them as best we can as we engage people uh, in conversation about you and about the future and about eternity and judgment. We pray, Father, that you would in your providence guide us, direct us to open minds and open hearts. That you would use us to your glory to be lights to others that they may see you and that they may desire to know your will and do your will. And we pray, Father, that each of us would have that same desire to continue to do your will, to learn it better, to draw more closely to you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. There may be someone in the assembly today who needs to respond to the invitation of God that is always open. It may be that you are not a Christian yet, and you understand and recognize who God is, and you understand and know who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you, and you're ready to commit your life to Him, to turn from your sins, to be united with Him in baptism, to have your sins washed away. If you're ready to do that today, we're going to invite you in just a moment to respond and come do that. We'll help you. If you'd like to know more, you're not quite ready to make that decision, but maybe you've got a little pebble in your shoe, and there's something that you need to address, and you want to know more, and you want to have those, those things, um, you want to study them and have them opened up to you from the Word of God so that you can better understand and know. Let us know that if that's your desire today. I know we have many children of God in the assembly today, already Christians, but maybe you haven't been as engaged as you need to be with others. Maybe your light is not shining as brightly as you know it should. I would encourage you today to pray God for pardon and mercy, for allowing your light to go out, and pray for His strength and His help that you would relight that fire and be the light that you should be. If we may pray with you today, we invite you to come as well as we stand and sing together.
seated, please. We want to welcome everyone here this morning, both our members and our visitors, and especially we say welcome to our visitors. We are very glad that you decided to come and worship with us this morning. And uh, we would write, like to remind everyone to fill out an attendance card you'll find on the backs of the pews in front of you. Pass them to the aisles and they'll be picked up shortly. And while you're doing so, I want to remind our members to notice any visitors that might be in your area and be sure to welcome them warmly after our services are concluded. Also, I would remind you to be sure to pick up an announcement sheet that you'll find at each of the exits as they will contain more information than we'll mention at this time. Um, first order of business, um, as some of you might know, the York family has recently decided to join the Brown, Brown Trail family here. And so, as I understand it, we have not yet had the opportunity to embarrass them, so we'd like to take care of that right now. So, uh, Brandon and Lindsay, if you would just stand for a moment, and family, so we can find you. There we go. And kids, Timothy, uh, Charlotte, and Caroline. So this is to help us put a face with a name. And so now that you're thoroughly embarrassed, you may be seated. Uh, so be sure to find them after our services are over and, and welcome them. Um, we do have a number of uh, families to whom we would like to express our sympathy um, at this moment to uh, Ben Goodrum and Scott and Vic Vicki Hagler on uh, the death of our uh, dear sister, uh, Winnelly, uh, who passed away September 3rd and the funeral was this past Friday. Also to Gwen Woodard, and family on the death of her son, Walter W. Woodard, who passed away September 6th, and the funeral arrangements are pending at this time. And then to J.J. and Lisa Hendricks, and family on the death of J.J.'s father, Jim Hendricks, who passed away September 5th. Uh, the funeral is this afternoon in Arkansas. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other families that uh, we need to remember to keep in our prayers. Um, Matthew Fleeman, uh, son of Dan and Sandra Fleeman, uh, remains in Medical City Hospital in Plano. He will begin chemo on Monday. Matt is too sick for calls or visits uh, right now, but please uh, continue to pray for him and the Fleeman family. And Doris Powell will have gallbladder surgery on Thursday at Baylor Grapevine. And then Jim and Shirley Wilcox's daughter-in-law, Chris, whose uh, surgery went very well. Her doctors don't think that the cancer has uh, spread to her lymph nodes. So we want to continue to keep all of these families in our prayers. And then we have a couple of items in the news. Uh, congratulations uh, to Jacob and Katie Selby, who were married last night. And then both the Wednesday morning and Wednesday evening ladies Bible classes will resume this week. So you can see the printed bulletin for additional details. And then finally, don't forget the parents meeting with John Warrens this evening following our worship assembly to discuss the youth calendar. And everyone is encouraged to bring your own uh, brown bag. <clears throat> If you all stand uh, for our closing song and prayer. <clears throat>
Shall we pray together? Father, we know the blessings and help that we receive from your hand are more than we can understand. And we're so thankful for that care and consideration. We pray also, Father, that the sick and afflicted of our congregation may be helped with their cares and concerns and healed if it is your will for their lives. We thank you for the lessons we have heard this morning. May they help us to do better in the future than we have in the past. Help us to care for others as we have the opportunity and be what you would have us to be. And it's through Christ who died for us that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 